Thank you. Everybody appreciates your welcome, and especially a warm one. And so, that's very gracious of you. I am thrilled that you're students of the Word of God. We live in a world where many things are being studied, and where people spend their lives studying beetles, and spend their lives studying bugs, and spending their lives studying reptiles, which may be very interesting. But you and I are studying the eternal Word of God that lasts forever. Amen. And we're studying our relationship with that blessed Word, which makes it glorious. So we're delighted to study with you. Beginning in this lesson on page 27, the first apostolic miracle. We have moved through Acts the Apostles chapter 1 with the promise of the birth of the church. We have now moved through chapter 2, the phenomena of the birth and the great things surrounding the, the story of the birth of the church. We have now moved into chapter 3 of the Acts of the Apostles, and we have the first apostolic miracle that's identified. In chapter 2, it says the apostles laid hands upon many, and all kinds of wonders and things took place, but they didn't identify one yet. Here is one that's identified, and we're told about. Pentecost brought with it the fulfillment of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which promised authority, energy, or power to those who witness, and that they would do greater works than even he did in his ministry. On the days following, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. In the third chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 11, it says, as the lame man, which was healed by Peter and John, that all the people ran together unto them and the porch, that is called Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. And Peter, when he saw it, he answered the people, you, you people of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look ye so earnestly and, or intently upon us? As though by our own power, our holiness, we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him, hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of your all. Now that, that's, that's what you call preaching. That is illumination. That is the answer to the problems of a, of a human mind. All right, let's look at this instance here of the first apostolic miracle. Number one, they discovered a man of great need. Now, if, if we're to follow the church pattern in the Acts of the Apostles, the church must discover the needs of men. A group of psychologists the other day, a few weeks ago, announced that over 30 million Americans were in a state of depression needed, needing medical help. How did some preachers find that out? Why do you have to wait for psychologists to find out how many people are sick in the mind? Rather than running and hiding uh, from the needs, we're supposed to discover their needs. They found a man in need. They discovered a man in need. The church should live in discovery, discovery of human need. In Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Peter and John went up into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a, and a, certain, and a certain man, that was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a, and, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So, let's look at that verse. Peter and John, at the hour of prayer, went into the temple. This is very good. Maybe you don't realize it, but your neighbors are watching you. If you even leave home late for church on Sunday morning, they even gossip about it. Yeah. Those folks left late. To, they don't go to church at all themselves. They left late. They can't be there on time unless they break the speed limit. How I many brother be a good witness? 
I'll leave on time then. Uh, they encountered a crippled person begging for charity at the door of religion. At the door of religion. Religion was not his answer. Religion had been there a long time and it hadn't answered his need at all. So they encountered this cripple and he was begging. This disabled man became a challenge. Anytime we see a problem, it should challenge us. Anytime human need crops up, it should challenge us. We should never turn our heads. We should never look the other way. When these men received the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was real to them, it was just as real out on the temple steps as it was up in the upper room. God's power is just as real on Main Street as it is where you're sitting right now. God's power is real anywhere, everywhere that you put it into, into action. And point number two, this need was expressed. The helpless invalid only knew of one thing to ask for, and that was for some kind of existence, either fruit of some kind or some coin of some nature. He held out his hand for anything that they were willing to offer to him. He asked for something to help him with his existence. In chapter 3, verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he saw his opportunity, he saw his chance, he saw some people that looked as if they might be religious, he saw some people that might have some compassion. He didn't ask everybody for money, he let some of them pass by. But these, these, he immediately said, alms please. Instead of turning the other direction and not looking, the disciples gave full attention to the man's request. They gazed upon him and saw his total need, spiritual and physical. Resigned to his condition to make a believe normal life was impossible. That he would never walk. They had brought him there from a baby every day, carried him in their arms, the Bible says, and laid him at that gate. He was resigned to his condition. He didn't think there's any hope for him. But the apostles saw a need far deeper than the superficial. All he wanted was a little money or a little fruit or a piece of a garment of some kind. But the apostles looked further than that and saw his real needs. He may have known them, but he wasn't courageous enough to state them. So exercising the authority, Peter commanded the beggar's attention in, in chapter 3, verse 4. Peter fastening his eyes. That'd be good for you to underline. He just gazed at him. Fasting his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. Don't be afraid to do that. Say, look on us. Have a look at us. This request reveal the wisdom of God and not human pride. No relationship to human pride. He wasn't saying, look on us because we're fishermen. Look on us because we've got the power of the Holy Ghost. Look and see what God's done. And this beggar's expectant response opened the door. In the next verse, verse 5, And he gave heed unto them. <laughs> Wrong reason. He expected to receive something from them. When they, when they said, look on us, he said, man, I want to get a nice piece of money here. You see, wrong reason. But at least he looked, and that was, that was what he needed to do. Verse 6, the next verse, he says, Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Such as I have, give I unto thee. You know, the church today is just the opposite of that. They've got silver and gold, but they don't have any of God's power. That don't mean you couldn't have both, because you could have both if you didn't have the wrong attitude toward them. But he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. He was positive about what he did have. I'm going to give it to you. Now, that's, 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 that's what you call faith. He didn't say, I'm going to pray for you, and maybe, maybe, maybe. No. That's like some of your modern preachers. You know, and not sure of anything. But he said, just look on me. I'm going to give it to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. Whew. Talk about a thunderstorm passing over Jerusalem. Brother, they had a thunderstorm. And Peter was so excited about it, he didn't wait for him to get up. He helped him up. 
He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And instantly or immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. He received strength. First time in his life, received strength. Having given the command to walk, Peter helped him get up. He wasn't moving fast enough. Shriveled little muscles, twisted bones, became firm and strong and normal. The first great miracle of the church. Because he believed he would receive something, the man was made whole and began to rejoice. He believed he was going to get something, but he got a lot more than he believed for. In verse 8, it says, And he leaping up, Ooh, brother, he got a shot of it, didn't he? Talk about adrenaline, brother. He got a shot of it. Leaping up, he stood, he walked, and he entered with them into the te temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Ooh. Now that would mess up more Pharisees than you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> that was a contradiction to everything they'd ever taught to the people, you see. And praising God. Physical healing came by an act of faith. I believe, I believe, I believe, an act of faith. Spiritual healing brought joy and strength into this life. And your point number six, the unexpected sight of the poor man upright on his feet caused astonishment and bewilderment. It still will. Every newspaper in town will write the story different. They have a gift that way. <laughs> Astonishment and bewilderment of the people. At verses 9 and 10, this is Acts chapter 3. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat for alms at the beautiful gate. Well, he'd been there 40 years, no wonder. At the gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. Those same people had all the stories of the Bible, they had all the stories of Moses, all the stories of Elijah, all the stories of Elisha, and still full of wonder and amazement. Now that, that is so remarkable that people can be so religious and be so dumb at the same time. Amen. It is just simply amazing. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. So the loud shouts of hallelujah attracted a crowd which ran to catch a glimpse, and the beggar was readily recognized by all those who came. They knew who it was. Rejoicing in his newfound love, the formerly lame man held on to Peter and said, this is the man that did it, this is the man that did it. The apostles preached Christ to the astonished onlookers and exhorted them to repent. And so that was the first great public solitary miracle beginning in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants those kind of miracles to continue. There is a place in God and a place in Christ I create a place in the holy anointing where these miracles do continue today. Only with those that believe, only with those that desire, only with those who are looking for these things to take place. A natural sequence to that is what you find on, find on page 30, the, the first persecution. The first miracle is followed by the first persecution. The healing of the lame beggar in chapter 3 gives us the, the background and the occasion for the first persecution of the church. The priests and the Sadducees, attracted by the commotion, gathered around the fringes of the crowd and they heard Peter charging the Jews with the rejection and murder of Jesus and proclaiming his resurrection. The apostles and, and probably the lame man, they were all arrested, just put in jail. In verse 2 there of chapter 4, it says, being grieved that they taught the people being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They didn't like either one of the subjects. It's a remarkable thing that people in authority, from time immemorial, through the pride of their own hearts, deny God the power to set people free on planet Earth. He does it anyway. Can you say amen? Oh, amen. And, and, and on the results of the healing on, on page 30 of your teaching syllabus, the, the religious authorities demonstrated anger, against the apostles. Can you imagine it? Because they got a man healed, they got mad about it. Uh, they, 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 they demonstrated anger against the apostles and also against the poor guy that got healed. Can you imagine people getting mad because you get healed? They get angry at you because you got healed. Peter and John were arrested and were put in jail under the next day since it was already late. It was about 3 o'clock when the thing started. 
So it would be sundown now. And verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now evening, eventide. And faith came in that center that day, and many who had heard the message believed. Look at verse 4. Howbeit many of them that heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. Well, brother, you get 5,000 men saved, they bring the ladies with them. You got 10,000, they bring the kids along, you got another 20,000. You got a whole city saved that day. That, 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 that was a tremendous move of the Almighty. So if the men that were saved uh, were five and their wives were five and a minimum of two children, you got 20,000 people added to the church that day. And your point number two, the miracle, this miracle and the gift could have operated through Jesus when he had visited the temple during his lifetime. You ought to put a lot of lines around this little note here. That Jesus went in and out that same door many times. That beggar was there every day. Jesus may have placed a, a pomegranate or an orange or banana into his hand several times. And no doubt inside of him said, you, you know, you know if, if I heal you today, he says, all it'll do is, is get me thrown out of, the, out of the city and you thrown out of the church. But since in a few days my, my disciples will come by here and they'll heal you with my power and, and, and there will be 5,000 men saved that day. He says, hold on. Now, you got a great truth there. And sometimes God's timing is not yours. Because God's timing is good timing and right timing. And God knows when a miracle in a person's life will bring the greatest glory to the body. And it's good to work with God's timing. And be ready for God's timing. Can you say amen? amen. And so, the, the, the miracle and the gift should, uh, could have operated through Jesus when he visited the temple during his lifetime. However, however there would have been no great ingathering of souls because of it. As it today, God's timing for miracles is overwhelming in significance. Now, the Sanhedrin met to question the apostles. This is in the same chapter, 4, beginning in verse 7. And when they had set them aside, had set, had set them in the midst, this is of Peter and John, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Can't you hear those old backslidden preachers saying that? I've heard them say things just like that, you know. And, uh, and then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, he got a, he got a new touch. <laughs> he got a new anointing. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, you rulers of Israel and you elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Brother, there were some people ducking their heads real fast around there and hiding behind the post too. And then he declares, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven whereby men, among men, whereby we must be saved. What a tremendous sermon. It's so different from the day of Pentecost. So different. Just read the two and say, hey, is that the same preacher? One time he's talking like a lamb, another time like a lion. And that's what the Holy Ghost will do for you. With a proud status of superiority, the Jew says, by what power? By what name? Did you do this by Moses' power? Uh, what, what power did you do this? The apostles were treated with contempt while under arrest. Their, their crime was causing a disturbance in the temple. They, they, that's what they said. The Pharisees uh, professed to be builders for God, yet the disciples claimed these leaders had misjudged and rejected the headstone of the corner. Didn't know anything about building for God at all. In Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. And that was the prophecy of Jesus. In Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said unto them, Do you, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Speaking that that prophecy had not come true, and that he was the keystone that holds the great body of Christ together. Under direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the, the apostles gave no defense, and no argument, and no apology. Let's look at that again. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, these men of God gave no defense, 
They gave no argument. They gave no apology. They said, there's a man. He'd been there 40 years. He's healed. Bless God. Have a look yourself as he dances right in front of you right now. They declared that the name that, they, that healed the cripple was that of Jesus, whom those people had crucified. So they were identified with him. The power was the same God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, and they're all witnesses. Forty days they had witnessed him after he rose uh, from the dead. Point number five, unpleasant memories. Peter's boldness, his clarity, his directness shocked all that bunch of religious people, the hierarchy. The, the unschooled fishermen were recognized as Jesus' disciples, both in learning and in spirit. That's in verse 13, chapter 4. When they saw the boldness of Peter and of John, you know, God can give you a boldness that you never had before. Hallelujah. You can, you can become bold and say, how, how do I manage this? It's not like me at all. Amen. When they saw the boldness of Peter and of John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, that what they were saying wasn't said in the classic Hebrew, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had, a, they, they had a knowledge that if you ever got with Jesus, you'd be different. And that here were some men that were natural that had become supernatural by being with Jesus. Now here were men that were ordinary who became extraordinary because they had been with Jesus. And sometimes your enemies know more about you than you know about yourself. And sometimes your enemies know what's happened to you better than what you know what's, what's happened to you yourself. They, they, they identify with what you've received from from God supernaturally in a stronger measure than you do. And so here we have indisputable evidence. We have the healed man standing straight, standing strong, and yelling loud. They weren't going to put in damper on him. And, and, and I, I like that. When a man gets so much blessing from God that nobody can control it. Nobody can say, hey, you shut up. He says, I'm going to get louder. Yeah. And, 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 uh, here he was, living evidence of the power of God. That, that was the way it was in my life, when I, especially when I was a young man, that I had had tuberculosis, that I, I had with me the, 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 the papers from the hospital and the x-rays. <laughs> you know, I had them. And then uh, tuberculosis in both lungs, so you couldn't, you know. I tell you, if you pay for the x-ray, you have some new ones made. I was very bold saying what God had done. And you, you'd be amazed at the people that touched their lives. The healed man were standing up. The rulers and the elders and scribes wanted to deny the miracle, stop the spreading of the gospel, but there was no way to do it. And, and, and however, the healing was immediate. It was complete. It was astonishing. I'd underline all of those. That's, what the, that's the kind of healings I like. It could not be refuted. Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Although the council threatened punishment to the disciples if they used the name of Jesus again, Peter and John refused to be intimidated. Thank God. In Acts 4.18, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. Hey, that's a hard one, wasn't it? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and the things we have heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how, how they could punish them. <laughs> they wanted to cut off their heads and couldn't find a good reason for it. Because of the people. You know, when you get thousands of people say, Brother, you better not mistreat the guy this blessing because they'll move on you. And because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. They were all still shouting about it. So the threats of the Sanhedrin failed to frighten them. They, they had a defiant boldness. Uh, they, were holding, they were holding the warnings of the Jewish council in contempt, paying no attention to it whatsoever. So immediately the disciples met with their friends and, and took the matter before the Lord, asking for even more boldness to proclaim the word of God. So in verses 29 to 31, then so the Lord, and now Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, hey, all boldness is more than more boldness, 
with all boldness, that they may speak thy word. So stretch forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was, was, was shaken, and they were where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak and began and, and they spake the word of God with great boldness. The whole bunch did, the whole church. God gave them a spirit filled liberty. And so here we find the gift of faith is when God supernaturally does something for you. The work of miracles is when God supernaturally does something uh, through you. And so we see it functioning here. The results of the gifts of power, when the church had finished praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with boldness. And, and God knows we need a Holy Ghost boldness today that we've never had before. We need boldness more than we've ever had it before. And, and Acts 4, 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any, any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And, and verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Well, that's the way the church was born. I'm mean, glad to be part of the church. That's the way the church got born. And, and uh, if you belong to that kind of church, you believe in miracles. And Jesus Christ, Hebrew says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. All that he did do, he does do. All that he could do, he can do. And he's ready to do them.